about 30% of our properties are going through some financial distress right now. We're very scared about what is occurring. This guy who owns this house lives in California. The house is totally stripped, but he doesn't care because he's just trying to dump it back on the market. He bought it for a thousand, he'll sell it to you for 10, and he'll find somebody to buy that $10,000 paper for him cheaper. Houses that were boarded would sell for 20,000, and then six months later sell for 40,000 or 50,000 or 60,000, and then two months later sell for 80,000 with no work being done to the houses. Not only were they selling them, for a lot of them, nobody was even moving into them. They were just staying vacant. I mean, it just seemed wrong. I think this one was 85,000. And, and it had previously sold the year before for 10. 10,000? Yes. <laughs> Houses were being sold to people that didn't seem to have jobs. Houses were being sold to people that had to have zero credit. And not surprisingly, those houses were going into foreclosure within a period of two to three months. This only happened in a short time. This was a 10-year window. This neighborhood's been around over 100 years. This was a man-made disaster. The level of abandonment was staggering. So one of the first things we did was we started to paint the boards on the houses gray and then decorate them. But it was only looking back that we saw going from vacant houses to abandoned houses to uh, houses that were completely wide open. You can strip a house and get thousands of dollars at the scrapyard. The more enterprising thieves would check the eviction records or check the foreclosure docket to see which houses were going empty. And they were in that house almost immediately, removing the air conditioning, the heating, all the copper pipes. And by the time they were through, the house that might have been saved was not savable. Before I bought this house, I lived on a house on a street over, and uh, the house had gone vacant, had been vandalized, had the aluminum siding stripped off of it, and they came to demo it. And I stayed home from work that day because it was just extremely upsetting. It was where my youngest daughter was born, and, and I, I literally just cried. We began to see the emergence of something called zombie properties in Cleveland neighborhoods. You know, a zombie is something that's uh, dead but still alive. The bank would initiate a foreclosure, right? The folks would get the notice and say, oh, time to get out of the house, and they did. Then the house, not surprisingly, would be stripped of anything of value, making the house worthless. Well, the bank had initiated the foreclosure, right? And they came out to the house and said, oh my goodness, we don't want this property and they made an economic decision to walk away from the mortgage foreclosure. So these houses, by the thousands, were hanging out there in limbo, alive but dead. We were losing two houses a day to foreclosure. Families were having to move. You saw a lot of churning of families. You see churning in the schools. So you lost a lot of the cohesiveness of our community. One of the largest little leagues in the city of Cleveland actually became extinct. We had two bowling alleys that closed. We had some of our social and civic organizations shut down. We had three church closings. On the street where I was saying that my old house was torn down, there used to be 10 houses, there's two left. And it's, it's shocking. I can tell you all the neighbors who live there, all their names, their kids. My kids went to school with them and um, all those houses are gone. When you go to the housing court, about 8.30 in the morning, the room was packed. It was packed with absentee landlords who were taking care of their property. It was packed with representative banks who were responsible for the house that was a zombie property. But it was also just filled with poor Clevelanders who didn't have the ability to repair their homes and who were working with the judge to find a way to get their house out of violation. They stripped the aluminum siding off of it. The plumbing's been stripped out. Uh, and so it is a nuisance uh, subject to being demolished. The city doesn't have enough money to demolish all the properties. But these two properties look like good candidates to be demolished. You are not a responsible owner. You are part of the overall scheme, and there are many corporations involved in this, in destroying our city. With vacant properties of this type, they attract criminal activity. 
And so you are endangering the very lives of the people who are left in the city of Cleveland. You saw a higher level of frustration in Ray because he realized this was, uh, this was different. And I remember once when I visited him and he just sat in his chair and he pushed back in the chair. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. The tools in our toolkit just weren't working, right? They weren't working. We really needed a more radical solution. We needed something that could help to get into the middle of this problem and try to, in effect, uh, create some order where there was none. Zombie properties are almost all tax delinquent. The land bank has the ability to go in and take those tax delinquent properties, take title and bring them within the land bank. It takes control of those properties early on in the process and prevents them from going back into the stream of predators. When I first heard of the model of uh, the land bank, I thought, wow, what a novel idea. But I also thought this is gonna be a challenge to get our government to be able to embrace creating another entity. Without a law and without the official imprint of government or some authority, we would not be able to do what we needed to do. The only person I knew to write this bill was Gus Frangos. He's a great attorney, top of his class. Secondly, he's a very patient individual. He realized that writing a complex bill was not gonna happen overnight. One of the things that we did, and, and it almost derailed things, was when we started meeting and Jim is very inclusive. He wants everybody to be at the table. And so the meeting of three or four turned into the meeting of 12. And then we're sitting around city council table one day, and there were like maybe 30 people around the table. And I have to admit, I got frustrated because people started talking about things that were important, but they're not relevant. So what we did was we concluded and said, listen, we kind of know what we need here. How about if I draft a memo, like if Dorothy could click her heels and come up with a bill that had everything that we wanted. Um, how about if I draft that, everybody weigh in, and if everybody is yes, then we'll go with that. So that became the famous Dorothy memo. And it had everything that we wanted. We want an entity, we want tax foreclosure, and we want funding. So that resulted in a year-long interviews that I had to do with the auditor's office, the treasurer's office, the clerk's office, uh, the sheriff's office, and board of revision. All of them, I had to understand their systems so that you can take that and put it into the bill. So the bill began in the Senate. Then we also knew that after the Senate, it would go to the House. So we had to line up our, our sponsor in the House, and then we had to line up our supporters in the House of Representatives. So it's like a juggling act. I mean, you've got this ball in the air, it's the Ohio Senate, but you know the Ohio House ball is about to land, and then you've got the advocates and the opponents. So you're juggling all these balls and trying to get them, uh, make sure you don't drop any of them. There were times when it was very exciting because we felt we had uh, what we needed and the support. And there were also moments when we thought uh, that the whole exercise was on a respirator. There were some uh, assemblymen that would that took the position that, wait a minute, this is too much power given to one entity. We got to curtail it. Uh, what impetus is there for the uh, LRC to then sell these properties? Uh, how do we get it back into the private uh, enterprise system? The point is, is that if a redeveloper wants to do something and wants to remediate his bigger problem is the toxic title and the taxes. So through foreclosure, the taxes are, are, are cleaned, the title is cleaned, and now a redeveloper could come and do what he needs to do without those two other impediments. And it allows basically a safe harbor. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the House Ways and Means Committee for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you in opposition to the passage of Senate Bill 353. One of the strongest opponents to the bill was the group of flippers. And boy, did they come armed for battle. They came to the committee hearings and they said, this is undemocratic, this is un-American, you're taking away our right to own property. And we kept saying, wait a minute, you're gonna be able to own property. You're just not gonna be able to take some of the worst properties dress them up, lipstick on a pig, and sell them off to some unsuspecting buyer. The legislators have a hundred things on their mind. They don't know who people are. They don't know, for example, if the, re if the flippers are just, you know, a gnat on a fly swatter, or if they're the fly swatter itself, whether they have, you know, a lot of power in the state. I learned a long time ago that every time you think you've got everything resolved, that, you know, something else comes up. 
I mean, we've always known our enemy is time. Hi, almost, we're there, we're close, we're close, hi, how you doing, hi. Yeah, we're almost done, hey, how are you, how are you, almost done, last committee, last committee, one way or the other we'll know. Hello, my name is uh, Marion Gardner and I'd like to thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I um, bought a house in Cleveland in 1974, there are approximately 76 houses on my street when I moved there. Now we have four vacant lots and only 20 families living on the entire street. On the right of me, on the left of me, behind me on the next street are vacant houses. Across the stop sign, I'm second house from the corner, the entire corner is completely gone. If it's not for my neighbor across the street, who is also a single woman and living alone now that all our children are grown and gone, if I was to scream, there would be nobody there to hear me. It's not a street anymore. It's not a neighborhood anymore. It's a cemetery. And our homes now are the gravestones. Thank you. Would you please uh, fill out a witness slip? Because the time restraints, the committee is going to recess and, and start and resume a meeting and following session this afternoon. We're adjourned for now. Thank you. Okay. Well, you know, folks, thank you so much. It's all timing now. Here's the story. It'll be, vote, it'll be voted out of the committee this afternoon. Going to go to the floor of the House tomorrow. And then after it passes the floor of the House, it's how quickly we can mesh between the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate. It's all timing now and the guy upstairs. It's all timing. That's what it gets down to, really. That's it. I mean, I, it would be a real tragedy if we get it out of both houses, but not meshed, so we don't have a bill. But, you know, we'll see. Hun, uh, it looks like we're going to have to stay overnight tonight. Uh, one, one more night. Um, what is happening is, is the, uh, they had to, to recess our, our bill. They had to recess what we did, and they went in um, to the full house floor to vote on a bunch of other bills um, and then because they had to because they had to he, to hear hundreds of other bills it was just the, the regular you know work of the house so if they recess for 60 it'll be 2 30 they'll go back into there well then i'm just gonna sit here and be a good boy but We have a Republican mint. We have Republican mints and Democrat mints. Um, mint. No, no, why don't you go? Go, go. Uh, you, yeah, give it at least an hour. Right here? I'm sitting right here. All right, you really are Forrest Gump. I am Forrest Gump. I don't have anything else to do. Actually, Nothing. Okay. It's got to come out today, or it can't make it to the floor of the House by tomorrow, and it will not be able to then get to the Senate, not in the time we have left. So either if it doesn't leave this committee now, we have no, we have no law. We adjourned at uh, about a quarter to 11, and now it's a quarter to three, so it's been uh, uh, four hours. Jim, you know you were allowed to leave. If you left, we were okay. I never left the bench. Matt, how are you doing? How are you? Jim, hey, testimonies. Matt, thank you for all your help. We're reconvening from this morning. Uh, we, we accepted some amendments this morning on House bill, or Senate bill, I guess it is, yeah, 353. Um, what's the pleasure of the committee? Representative Dolan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that the committee move favorably. Uh, Senate bill was it 353 uh, to the Rules Committee? Clerk, call the roll, please. 
Chairman Gibbs. Yes. Vice Chair Schindel. Yes. Representative Blessing. Representative Bolin. Yes. Representative Brinkman. Pass. Representative Chandler. Yes. Representative Dolan. Yes. Representative Foley. Yes. Representative Goyle. Yes. Representative John Hagen. Yes. Representative Robert Hagen. Yes. Representative Letson. Yes. Representative Mecklenburg. Yes. Representative Miller. Representative Slesnick. Yes. Representative Widener. Yes. Representative Wolpert. Yes. Representative Yates. Yes. Okay, the, the bill passes. Mr. Chairman, I've, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you, and, and I've enjoyed it. It's been a learning experience, of course. Every day's learning experience around here. And uh, I wish you well in the next General Assembly here in the House. I wanted to thank you for the effort you put in and sticking it out. And I think we've done some good things here in the committee this, this session. So thank you very much. Sort of know about legislation. You can think every I has been dotted, every T has been crossed, and you're about to pass a bill. All you need is one or two strong objections. All you need is somebody to throw a wrench into the works at the last minute, and the legislative wheels will stop, and all of a sudden your hard work is for naught. So we didn't know. There was that moment where the speaker turned and said, let's call the roll on Senate Bill 353. And you're watching the, the, the screen, for lack of a better word, and you're seeing the tally of all of the uh, people voting yay, nay, and as it's coming in, you're seeing the numbers, all the yays increasing more and more and more. And the gavel came down. The speaker said this bill is passed. You know, we were just um, dumbfounded that the fact that it really happened. And that's when uh, my tear ducts opened up and I began to sob because I realized that this bill we worked so hard on Spent so many hours traveling to Columbus, lobbying, worked so hard on that the bill was now law. We did it, man. <laughs> man, I just, it's like, I, yes, I'm still, uh, I'm trying, trying to take it in. I, I don't want to get emotional here, so. You know, what they said, what Batchelder said, you know? We have to make it work now. We have, have to, to make, make it work. It work. Yeah. They haven't signed it yet. And it was just a great, great feeling that, yes, a community can get together in the midst of a national crisis and still try to do something, and we did. I can't tell you how ecstatic I was and many of my colleagues were when we first found that this passed out of the State House. It was a Herculean effort to get this passed, and to me, it was a Hail Mary. And I've been in government for 34 years. I've done some things I'm very proud of maybe some things that I wasn't so proud of, but um, 
for me, this was the most important thing I've ever done. If this is my legacy, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. This bill is up here and it's a General Assembly initiative and all that, but it is very much affecting people uh, on, on their daily life. And it's just, you know, very emotional, heartwarming to know that you did something. It didn't solve everything, but you did something. We got some time, we got some time, but not much. I mean, there is an incredible responsibility we've just been given. You know, we wanted it, but now we got it. Now what? Now we got it. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Now what, right?